Hi. Hi. Fantastic timing. I haven't started my introduction yet, which I'm going to do now. I, I can get... disappear and come back if you like. Not at all. <laughs> so perfect because I get to, uh, you can be a part of the introduction. So Asalaamu Alaikum friends. Um, so good to have everyone back. I can see some uh, familiar faces, regulars, uh, uh, old Cube Editor community members, friends, family signing up. It's so nice to have this happen this frequently. Um, this is the Cube Editor's live session chat number 20 and Jogal Bandi series number six with Gene and myself. Good afternoon to Gene from the US who's live with us. Luckily, we've now finally sorted out our technical issues in terms of communication on the internet. Uh, for those of you who always ask me about uh, what is the book, I've almost made it a little bit traditional to now have a book to start the conversation with. So this is my book for today. Jean, you will recognize this. I can't read it backwards. I'm not Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> not Leonardo. No. <laughs> I know. I'm... So, this is an amazing book. Um, and I pulled it out today because... Um, of what we've been talking about, but the book is called The Whole Internet Users ah. Catalog, and it was printed in 1992. This book was part of my coursework at Columbia when we were looking at new technologies in education. So this was the first book that was written about the internet. And it's a great, um, it's almost like the, the Bible to be able to go back to and see how much of it has evolved over the last 25, 30 years. Now, <clears throat> I was thinking today, and I'm going to share this. Um, Wendy Brower, fantastic to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, Jean, Wendy's here. This is, <laughs> this is amazing. This is amazing. How fantastic. Wendy, this will be our first introduction of you and me, but hopefully not the last. So, you know, Jean, it's been amazing as I, as I, I always think about these chats and when I come back to them, that it started off as such a simple germ of an idea and how wonderful it is that something that one often disregards like heritage buildings, you know, we refer to them as ruins. And I think that's such a terrible word to refer to something like heritage buildings that as you can see, and everybody else on this chat over now 20 sessions can see how much thought something simple as a heritage building has facilitated and triggered for us that we have connected the earth, we've connected architecture, the architecture of the internet, pedagogical architecture, where we're going in the future post-pandemic. Uh, we've looked at maps, ancient maps, movement of civilizations. We've now invited uh, Wendy to talk to us about her incredible projects called Green Map. And the direction, the vast bandwidth that something as simple as a heritage building has launched us into this orbit, this new trajectory, and we go from one conversation to the next, but the genetics of the conversation all go back to that very first time when I thought we should talk about heritage buildings and the value that they have in our lives, past, present, and future. <clears throat> so very funny thing earlier today, talking of the future. Earlier today, Jean, there's a friend of mine who is a Texan. I met her in Santa Fe, New Mexico when I was there in 2002. And she was one of the first band members of the Dixie Chicks. She plays, she's a Maladin player, singer, songwriter, Sharon, Sharon Gilchrist. She lives in San Francisco now. And just earlier today, she was looking at my pictures. You know, some of you know that I've been in my own little think tank sanctuary with nature ensconced in grass and sun and trees and just getting deeper into some of the thoughts that we've been uh, talking about. <clears throat> she looked at those pictures and she was talking about how she, enchanted she's been with the tall grasses of Texas growing up as a teenager. And <clears throat> it was so funny how she, she said, you know, I said, Sharon, I, you know, I haven't spoken to you in so long, what's going on? She said, you'll never believe it that because of the quarantine lockdown and because of everything going online, I have more uh, students to teach mandolin to online mm. than I did before. Mm. And I said, wow, isn't that amazing? This is, this is what we're doing, we're heading into the future. And she says to me, no Zen, this is the future. You're in it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And I thought that you would love that story, that this has just happened literally a couple of hours ago. 
So I picked up this book and I was like, right, you are now potentially obsolete because 25, 30 years later, the internet changed. It's grown up. It's not a child anymore. It's got almost got its own systems it wants to follow. And here we are trying to say, okay, how do we navigate and negotiate a new system that uses the internet, uses those um, neurons of that simple one zero. You know, I was thinking about that also, Gene, that you said, you know, we, we shouldn't really talk about the coder or the person who uses zeros and one create these platforms or these environments. So the gamification coders are using one zeros. What we're doing right now has a backend that is all one zero based. And I just thought that it's so interesting that let's, let's say, fine, we don't want to think about them as craftsmen. And we don't want to think about these one zeros as more than just neurons of this or that. But isn't it wonderful that that synapse in our brain that gives you either a one or a zero response is the same fundamental, almost X, Y, that these coders, I don't want to use them as craftsmen, but they are creating all of these environments. And <clears throat> my skin for the last three days of absolute silence. I haven't spoken to anybody except for you for that one hour. Three days of silence. My skin was listening. It was mm -hmm. absorbing. And like Sharon and I said, you know, listening to the grass or the wind rustling through the trees is almost like nature whispering these sweet nothings to you, singing to you songs from its ancient past. And you just have to let yourself go, surrender, and let this music this enchantment come through, but it's coming through this system that's still only one and zero. The synapses between that one and zero have this incredible scale of what they can feel, what they allow you to feel, what you can absorb. Otherwise, we would have all our reactions would be either black or white. But the fact that within that one and zero, we have each of us individuals has this incredible, almost infinity of feelings and sensitivities and perceptions and acceptances, tolerances, patience levels, um, surrender fears, all of that between that one and zero. I thought, it, you know, maybe not today, but at some point it'd be really wonderful to come back to that and say, much as that which is happening on my skin, on my face and my hair, lying on the grass, it's all happening through that same synapse, which has only got the power to do either black or white, one or zero, just like the coders, who are also using the same one zero to give us financial models for banks, uh, the mechanics for how Wall Street runs, the, the, the dark, God forbid we ever talk about that, um, all, the, all the search engines that help us to do a little bit of look and feel research. It's not really research, but we can loosely call it research because there isn't better word. I mean, research is a much more erudite uh, practice. Googling something is not genuinely research. Um, so all of those options are being created from a zero and a one that that coder is deciding how to curate, essentially. They're putting it together in certain sequences that are giving these results. So that, that, that's why I picked up this book. <laughs> Having spoken to Dean, I thought, this is amazing because, <clears throat> you know, we've been looking at geometry. We've been looking at the relationship of the human body alignment and the earth. We found, I found those um, pictures of um, the Kushpi players from Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan. These are fantastic pictures. I have not been able to figure out who took them. I need to go back and check on that much more carefully. How the body in a game, in a sport, is so deeply rooted in the earth, in the dirt, in the movement of it, in raking it, in preparing it, in respecting it. And <clears throat> we've also got architecture. So not only is my heritage architecture, as you right, rightly said several weeks ago, that that is all coming out of the earth. It's coming from the earth. It's part of the land. It has stories to tell about the soil, about the people before we labeled it either as a ruin or as sacred. There was a time when it was just part of everybody's life and it wasn't really considered sacred necessarily. They've become sacred now. And you know, it's amazing because it made, made, me, made me think about uh, Earth ships and Michael Reynolds' work. Um, I have a book, I was looking for that book actually. I have a book on his work here. 
and I couldn't find it, but hopefully I'll find it for next time. I think it's right here behind in the shelf, carefully put away. <clears throat> Earth ships are incredible because he's categorically said it's part of the Earth, it's a form of habitation, it's self-sustaining, it's off the grid, it's not dependent on any infrastructure, it's not dependent on any form of governance. So when we talk about how do we create what we want to do, what would be its boundaries? How would it be governed? How would it be kept within a certain set of parameters? Because we don't really want it to be anarchic. It is an educational system that we're trying to come up with. So looking back at how he takes lost materials, forgotten materials, recycled materials, if we take any one of his earth ships, and you and I have probably seen the same earth ships in Taos, he's been building them in other parts of the world. So there's some earth ships in South America, there's some in Mexico, there's some in Africa, they're in other parts of the world. They're also in Australia, I believe. Um, all along that same latitude, <clears throat> and in terms of climate, uh, where there is an option of rain, they collect their own rain, there's enough sunshine for solar power, there's enough land to be tilled to grow their own food, etc etc so i thought it'd be really wonderful to actually think about this whole new direction of how do we put into our post pandemic educational model the idea of an earth home an earth ship i like that it says earth ship because then it reminds me of noah's ark and it reminds me of this other place that we can go it's almost like the ships that the pharaohs use in their pyramids to fly out of the pyramids to do a circle of the sun and come back so it's that sort of a ship that in, in a very like crude reality sits there on the ground. It's not going to move, but actually it's extremely dynamic in its life, in the life that we experience with it. So you're not using it. It's actually, there's a constant dialogue happening between you and your earth ship. And it's connected to the earth. It's taking recycled materials, putting them together again. And then it's completely disconnected to governance. So how, how do we bring our... Uh, ideas of governance, you know, Gene, there was also there, somebody on in the group may be able to help. My fear <clears throat> with governance, and it has to be looked at, that who's going to say yes or no? Who's the editing person? Who's the curator? Who is the controller of the source, even if it is open source, like the library we've been talking about? There is also um, the control, right? That's what I always fear is can we have a system that controls itself and values its own, I don't want to say it, but its own morality, its own ethics. There has to be some sort of an ethics thing, some form of controlling, not controlling, some form of managing the humanity and making sure it doesn't go out of control, uh, which all sounds wrong because it's not really what I want. I want to give them, I want the horse to run amok. But we don't want it to take lives in the process because, I'm, you know, the whole violence thing always also freaks me out, as you know. So that's, that's a, it's a sensitive line that we'll have to navigate and find who, without then going into this idea of singularity, right? So I love the Brownian motion idea of these things, people colliding with each other, a, a, a global university being created where education comes out of collisions, mutually ex inclusive opportunities and coll collisions that they both enjoy, that they both get energized, and then you take it to the next level, like our Jugalbandi. Can we take this as a model and scale it up into a global idiom? But then my fear is of singularity, that how much control does a human go off to the machine um, and then become like Prometheus in the film? You know? So that's my intro for today. <laughs> well, I hope that your listeners participating listeners have made a diagram of what you just heard because all these <coughs> lights are flashing in my self and to me what's very central is the continued research by neuroscientists into the brain, to the extent that we know via the vagus nerve that we have three brains. Right. The organ in our head, our heart, and our gut. So right there, we throw <coughs> out the idea that 
somehow, as Descartes, Eugene Descartes, French philosopher, said, and was totally uh, used because the people didn't quote all of what he said. He said, I think, therefore I am. That's all you need to know. Well, we realize with the pandemic and the climate <clears throat> emergency that thinking without the body is gotten us to where we are now. Correct. So in relationship to what you're talking about, neural pathways chains that zero one is only a minute possibility among many but what's right. happening designers code designers and <clears throat> facebook and google young young people excited about the possibilities inventing a whole world, digital world in social media that now has consequences that they are horrified about. And they've written about this. So my point by bringing this up Ooh. is those of us like you and I who can walk in the grass, lie in the open, under the stars, smell, hear, all the sensations of the body without letting ourselves be co-opted by the social media that we're using right now. And the feelings you talked about, how you felt, how you felt talking about the wind and just feeling the freshness of the air now that so many vehicles that were polluting it in the air and on the ground are not moving. That's because in our brains, we have these three brains and we have access to those feeling tones. This is before words. And <clears throat> my understanding of what we are struggling with and we both know that our differences are very important so you know when i say we and i talk about the overlap the there's a lot that doesn't that we're different and that's the possibility right. that the shared is this concern about the impact of social media on populations, even you don't have to have just been born in the quote digital age. There are many people who, who do not understand that the living earth is not a potted plant. And even a potted plant has powers once somebody starts slowing down and taking care and communicating this idea of shared co-creation. So I, I, I look at the internet through the eyes of Marshall McLuhan, a media prophet, his book, Understanding Media, written before the internet in the 60s, the 1960s, but imagining that a possibility of the internet is this huge, access like you have, like Wendy Brower, who will be speaking to you soon from Green Maps, like I have from all these different worlds, each one of these names I see coming up, give them all this challenge. How can we bring back the source of joy in life, which is curiosity and your desire to know that isn't manipulated, that doesn't make you immediately run to buy something that will satisfy it. Once I used to love going places where they had, you know, avocados like San Francisco. 
and then you can get them everywhere and they don't taste the same but my so my point is all we have access to so many people who are not controlled in thinking that this is the world to join us in creating through the crack in the universe that the pandemic has opened by cleaning the air so that we can breathe and the pollution is slowly oozing out of our cells. We can drink water that's cleaner than we've known in so long. And we can, you know, breathe. Well, breathing is the air, it's eating soil. Hopefully many of you have access to f food, which is the earth element that isn't toxic. And then there's the sun. My God, the sun is so bright because there's no pollution. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is hopefully all these people that are rushing in out, this is Memorial Day weekend in the United States, rushing yeah. outside, trying to go to where the living earth is. They don't realize that the magnet between them and those places that they, that have been closed, that have turned like Central Park in New York, parts of it are, are tents for sick people. Yes, they should be places like that because that's the living earth and we're just earth sprouts. Yeah. And you know, that, that <clears throat> magnetic pull, getting people out of their apartments and houses and wherever they've been holed up is also <clears throat> an opening for people who've only grown up or have given themselves up to a life of consuming rather than energizing yourself and then you know what are you gonna do you're gonna be curious i sent you an article mm. about uh where <coughs> curiosity is killed in our educational systems you know, yes. and the, the thing is, I don't, you know, teaching graduate students and working with uh, communities like Wendy Brower's community, which is on the same street as the New School in Parsons in Manhattan, on the Lower East Side, then, you know, you're with real people, 100% real people. So, you know, I can't touch your skin. I can't smell you. You know, it's like there's, yes, we're talking, but there's so much missing. And so this to me is how we frame the zero one. And yes, I've known you before. So when you gesture or I feel you're concentrating, I'm, I'm pulling in memory and things from the past that help me make you not a flattened screen. So I think I bought, managed not to answer any of the things that you ask about solidarity and earth ships. And I, 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 I will come back. <laughs> Yay, I did it, it's your turn. <laughs> but you know that's really interesting, Jean. So I'm trying to think about how do we take all of these things that you've listed, uh, which I've experienced over the last three days, without I've had I've had several friends ask me why did you do it, <laughs> and I didn't have. I just said I said I don't know. I I just had to do it, and I haven't. I think analysis is a, is is scary because if you think too much about it, the experience is lost. So I said I just went. And I wasn't afraid and I walked the grounds at three in the morning and I was there by myself. But I think it'd be really fun. So when you look at a screen and this is our future, we're, we're, we're basically trying to figure out how to take all of what you just said and migrate it into the digital internet based platform. What we could do, for instance, is every, um, Every program has a set of settings and it has a menu. 
So if we were to, <clears throat> in the menu, like an AutoCAD blueprint, have a legend of if you're taking course X on hair buildings, or you're taking course Y on the environment with Gene, or you're taking course X on governance at the Navajo, or you're in workshops with Michael Reynolds, you must have the following materials next to you to touch. Mm. But, uh, yes. Pottery, some grass, uh, turn off the heat, make sure you sweat. So we could give them a legend <laughs> of things that are sensual that would actually reflect the course. That they're so that way one can have an elaborate reality where your hands are connected to movement but even then you're moving through a space uh, beyond the 3D glasses, like you're playing tennis. You, can, you have these games where you can attach yourself to these electrodes and the computer will show you playing the game with the opponent. But this way we could have them do that and also give them a list of um, like a palette, like a painter's palette, saying here's what it looks like. I've, I've recently learned about, in fact, Madiha who's here, her sister has been playing with a watercolor program where it tells you how much water, how much paint, and you add the two and you drop it, how it'll spread. But there's no texture of the paper. So it'd be really fun to say, yeah. keep texture with you, keep a little bit of paint with you, keep a little bit of water with you, just to touch it. Because the paint will change texture once it's moist. You moisten it more, you will lose more control of it. You moisten it more, eventually you won't feel it. You'll only feel the liquid. So it would be, I think for us, be useful to, in our box, create a legend, just like a blueprint of an AutoCAD drawing for a building that tells you what each of the codes are. And these are the, these are the materials that you need to sit with when you have this course. So if we're talking about a course on understanding Sufi music or the poetry of Rumi, here are the other cross-references. We will give them the open source bibliography and say, here are your references to keep with you or to read before. Here are the materials. Here's a piece of wood. Here's a piece of bar. Here's a piece of polished wood. Here are things that you can touch on your skin. You can touch with the palm, at the, at the top of your hand or the palm of your hands. Caress with your fingers. Grass, leaves, million things. Metal, metal mirrors carpets, um, feathers, fur, just little snippets of like a mood board, like a materials board, so that we connect the two. And we've actually connected the three. So we've got the, the body movement attached to electrodes so you can move through the space. We've got an elaborate uh, interior created with woods, or it's a building, my heritage, one of my heritage buildings, or it's a Navajo um, sweat, sweat tent or it's the rocks inside Bandelier, but then you keep samples of material that would invoke, that would evoke that feeling, that feeling tone that you talk about. I think what releases that endorphin of this, that feeling tone is when we come in contact with the grass or the earth or the sweat or you know, the, the sound of the crow or the feathers. Like I met the micros this morning again, and with <laughs> we had a familiarity. So <clears throat> now I'm thinking when I go back to 2002, if you go back with me to 2002, and what would be your memory as a feeling tone of being inside one of Michael Reynolds' earth ships in Taos? Oh God! <laughs> that, that's a memory because then I'll share with you my memory. Once you share your, oh sure. What did that feel like? Well, the minute you mentioned two thousand and two, and I was not in Taos at that time. Oh, sorry. I was... Yeah, and so so, <laughs> a a sense of. Um, Anxiety came up because that was immediately following the attack on the Twin Towers yes. in 2001. 
Yes. So that is what came up. And living on the Hudson River, and the towers were also near the Hudson River, down further south, where I, my apartment is in New York, is higher than the low area for the towers. So what came to mind was, it was a beautiful, clear, absolutely clear fall day, September 11th. And the, the soot and the smoke and the ashes of human beings covered the city. You could smell, that's what I smelled. That's what I remember. People in Brooklyn, a friend of mine whose father had a restaurant in the top of one of the towers, papers from his desk were blown to people's yards in Brooklyn. So unfortunately, the earth ship, you know, that's, in a way, this is, is I think, an important um, pause for me because open source means to me that, for instance, you gave me what Marshall McLuhan would call a probe. And then you were talking about a box with a legend and then having the real materials. Open source would, would allow for what wasn't anticipated, for joining the effort and contributing something that hadn't been thought about, hadn't been listed, hadn't been felt. So that's what happened to me when you said 2002, that was much stronger than mm. the memories of the Earthship, which, you know, as I dig into my body, I can remember walking, you know, walking down and that's what's so powerful about the Vietnam Memorial is in, in Washington, is you walk down into the earth. And they're just, and actually, Frederick Law Olmsted, when you enter Central Park in the middle of Manhattan Island, off of Fifth Avenue and 59th Street, he intentionally had you walk down. He, he made it a clear, the body is entering the earth. And that seems to me the trigger, I don't know, that's not the right word because it's so associated with violence, the um, stimulus to the body feeling the connection to the earth because your body's down and it's so easy. Climbing up steps or a hill is exertion, but going down. You know, I, what comes to me is it's coming home, just like uh, so many burial processes now that return the body wrapped in a linen or cotton um, and to the earth, and then you return. So going into, and then having the windows in the earth ships be at about eye level, so it's very cool inside, even though you're in the middle of the desert. And this was summertime, not, not the winter. I do not know what it's like in the winter, and that would be very interesting. So you're, you know, you're both um, sort of like how I feel with people's writing across my face. I'm down here with them, or the ceiling up here above. I'm sort of in between the two worlds. And, and then, so when you look out the window in the middle of summer, it's very bright sun. You know, it's like shocking, shocking. Those two elements, the earth element and the energy element. And then of course he made it out of what was, uh, recycling didn't exist when he started. So he made it out of what we have thrown away. You know, metal, metal coming out of the earth wires coming and making bricks. So, you know, it's, it's um, very powerful 
to go from the memory of the World Trade Center, and as I say it, I get a chill. The instrument was something that humans created, the Wright brothers, the airplanes. The yes. airplanes were the vehicle of destruction. But the Wright brothers on the beach in the Carolinas, testing it. They came from a place that I lived at one point when I was in high school, Dayton, Ohio. They didn't know that that's how that could, you know, learning to fly, to be a bird, how it might be used by somebody else. And that's that whole Brownian effect that you talked about, Brownian motion. Yeah. We have an intention, but there's so many other intentions, and especially the larger intentions of the primary elements that made life that we have to let go of this thinking that somehow we're going to, that's what's so powerful about open source. We can contribute, you and I, and then all the people who want to con contribute to it, but with the understanding that something we haven't thought of is so welcome and out of it in alignment with the larger creative elements, the earth, air, fire, which is the sun, and water. So that's what comes to me when you say 2002. So interesting, I was in New York uh, when it happened. In fact, that morning, uh, I lived in an apartment, uh, a duplex on 7th Street and Avenue C. Mm -hmm. So from my second floor balcony, I saw mm. people jumping out of the buildings because mm. I was so close. So you lived, I've been to your apartment, you lived in the 70s on the Upper West Side. I was underneath the nose of the action. And they, if you remember, they had closed off south of 14th Street. So there was no traffic. I remember walking up and down First Avenue and Avenue A, dead quiet the next day, which would have been heavy traffic at two in the afternoon. And there was an army boy at Washington Square Park, so Fifth Avenue and Waverly, who would check our IDs on the way back from work. So I used to work at the Empire State Building, and I would walk home after work. And I found that whole process, uh, I, I was affected by the violence because that day, when we lost TV signal, we lost phone signal, we lost all our signals, and you just stand there and you watch this silent collapse happening in this dust. Uh, and all that happens is you're, you're mesmerized. Again, I'm not, I wasn't able to pick up my camera. I wasn't able to move. Mm -hmm. I was certainly feeling myself melt, knowing that the world order was changing because I was so up close to the entire financial district skyline, which is why we moved into that apartment for this picture postcard perfect view not expecting this to happen. Every, from, from 34th Street and 5th Avenue at the Empire State Building, home to 7th and C, between C and D, there was so, you imagine how many bus stops I walked past twice a day. <laughs> and faces were missing people. The oh. great people that hung across New York for months. I had a friend who came down to Ground Zero in, at, for Halloween. And I didn't have the heart to take him down there. I said, this is not something I have the capacity to go on. This is not a tourist thing. For me, it's very personal. And we've all been affected because now, suddenly, the anonymity of being a New Yorker has gone. You can certainly sense uh, us and them. And that young 18-year-old from Idaho, who used to check my ID, as he checked everybody's ID, the third day into it, I got really irritated. I said, how long have you been here? He said, three, four days. I said, where do you live? So we had a conversation. He said, I live in Boise, my family's. I said, do you understand that this is my home? Mm -hmm. You're questioning me about where I'm going and what I'm doing. These people that you see that are missing faces are people that I would see at the gym. I would see at the post office. I would see at the photocopiers at the, at the bar. These are people that I know. This is my home, and you're treating me like an outsider. Do not check my ID again. It's offensive. 
and it's violent. So he understood it. He got it. I said, you're a guest in my house, but mm. please don't make me feel like I don't belong here because this whole incident has not happened to you. It's happened to me. So then when I moved to New Mexico and I'm carrying this burden with me, I arrived in Taos and I get to experience these earth trips that we had only learned about in my course with you. So that was 1992. So 2002, I actually get to see them in real life. I didn't meet Michael Reynolds, but I went into it. <clears throat> the southwestern landscape with the clouds right here is like out of a film. You're in a cinematographic environment 24 hours of the day. Whether it's White Sands or it's a Rio Grande or it's the Four Corners, it's all spectacular. Um, so you, you drive, you're driving on the highway to Taos and then there's this flat mesa on the left and these creatures, like sculptures, appear from the, from the earth and you think, something lives in that? <laughs> drive close which so from a distance, because the materials are not flat surfaces, they're old bottles, they're cans, they're tires, they're leftovers. And for me, a lot of it is material he just picked up from garbage dumps. So from a distance, it's this very blurry, cloudy looking structure. And as you come closer, the details, its materiality becomes more evident. And then you come inside, it's very much growing out of the earth, like you said earth sprout for not for not one moment did i feel i was in a building mm. or a, and it was such a, my first revelation of getting away from urban uh, urbanity and the construct of modernism was the amish when coming back from Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright's falling water i spent one night in, in lancaster pennsylvania with the amish and then i realized that this manhattan thing is irrelevant. I, I could have another, an, an, another life, an alternative life that goes beyond this edge. And then when I came to, when I saw this, I thought, wow, this is amazing. They make their own water, they grow their own food. They have the sloping glass windows to make sure they've got the angle of the sun coming in. They've got the northern light coming in. They've got the moonlight coming in. They've got the drainage sorted. They've worked with the land. They know where the water table is, how the water is moving underneath them where the rain is coming from. The entire design of that building was based on the climate's geometries and its relationship to the surface of the earth, relationship to the surface below, and just a little tiny little human in between <laughs> manipulating these things for their own needs. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And those buildings came alive as the sun shifted, the shadows mm -hmm. inside shifted, the colors shifted, and you think that, you know, poor, poor Corbusier tried this in his church at um, uh, Roma. Um, Gaudi tried it in the cathedral that's not complete. And here is this man who's done it. These buildings are alive. And that dynamism of their energy was magical. I mean, New Mexico is a land of enchantment anyway. But I came away with such a clear picture of these earth ships. Um, funnily enough, two years ago, one of the girls who worked with me in my office and also was the lead designer, lead architect for the Karachi Zoo, took a semester off. No, she took a two-month workshop with Michael Reynolds uh -huh. and went from Karachi to Santa Fe. And she spent time there for, for two months. In fact, she came back with all these fun memories ah. from yes. Mexico. There's a, there's a Cocopelli line here someplace. So I think that that... That is a model worth exploring. The only catch is when you, like you said, the climate, it's all one latitude across the globe. What happens when we go to Sweden, Oslo, Reykjavik, then we look at Esk um, igloos, and then what happens when we go south to the tropics and you have to dig into the earth? So, or we look at earth architecture, like adobe, uh, like they do in Yemen, they do mm. in as parts of Sindh and Balochistan in Pakistan also, where it's all mud, baked mud, uh, bricks put together. <clears throat> Same issue. We take this onto the internet. We take this onto a digital platform. There needs to be something for people to see this and feel it. Like I carry this memory so clearly. And both memories, like you said, Jean, so close to each other. 
one the loss of my home and the second mm. to introduce to somebody else's living home completely new birthing process you know it was it was it was two extremes and um, quite spectacular so who's going to govern this the question is that oh. we can we can put all together <laughs> you use the phrase you use the phrase with the understanding anybody can contribute all the people who are signing up can contribute like members a members club they can all contribute to this open source of things that are interesting to them but just like somebody misused rights plain how do we know that somebody will not misuse the space because the internet space is being misused even now whether it's a dopamine effect of social media that we you and I keep coming back to or other darker activities when when one says with the understanding what what does that define well on your suggestion <laughs> I got curious about <coughs> the connection I make between democracy not not what we have today and right. native americans right. so i have mentioned in other chats that my library is all back in new york city so here in pennsylvania <coughs> i have accumulated some books but not the ones that are what i would call memories so i can't rush to a book to understand why i made that connection so i looked on line right and what did i find the iroquois confederacy is the source and that's the north eastern part of the united states basically five different separate nations five different what we might call bio regions and those joined sometime between 1400 and 1600 so you know clearly as or not clearly possibly because of the arrival of these strange humans from across the ocean so they joined together and it was it was a confederacy of peace and each of these uh what we see again the words that's why it's so important to feel what's in our body nation of course is not a word they would have had they had clans and they had territories and those <coughs> clans had their separate ways of joining again together in their bio region and then sending to the larger group their wishes so here's how they you know i have i haven't had a chance to find out how many people were involved but women had equal voting rights with the men and they sat in council men women and then joined I think it was 75% of each council had to agree women had equal presence. So this is one of the origins <clears throat> of democracy. And it's one that's been buried like so much of what the native people gave us by glorifying the contribution of the Greeks, which is real. and in the in the time of um what we call classical greece women did have rights they were free and they made their own um subsistence so that was there but the point i'm trying to make now is this equal voting and sitting and listening and coming to agreement as a as a governance now now we're dealing obviously with the world with 
so many more people. But that hesitancy is what stops trying it, trying it. And not as true believers. This is the other thing I struggle with. When I get curious and enthusiastic about something, I get totally immersed in it. I, I want to talk to you about your hands and what they touch, you know, and what it means. And whoo! <clears throat> so that energy, I want to, you know, I want to have both eyes open. There are people who don't necessarily agree with me, want to get everything online, want to turn our, our fingers into these electronic uh, reactors, not responders, not creators, not the contributor of all the body knows. So for me, that's part of the challenge right now. We can get very excited about what it is we are doing right now in this crack in the universe before and not before. The old institutions are not going to come back <clears throat> just by the mere fact that uh, time has changed them, let alone the pandemic. So no more us and them. Mm. I think I've mentioned to you, and it's a little shocking to say it with so many people listening, but there is no them Whatever it is I accuse other people of, you can be sure I have imagined it. And me as the actor, the perpetrator, as well as the victim. You know, in other words, the, the <clears throat> human nature is just such a complex, we can't even control human nature, let alone all these machines we're making. So I just think it's very important for me to remember that um, balance, balance is, is key and it's dynamic. And it's balance between all these impulses in me. The other day playing basketball with my grandson, he stepped on an ant and it was still struggling. And he, he was practically in tears. And I thought immediately of the ants I had killed inside my loft, because in an old barn, there are all sorts of means for other animals to get in here. So I, in his eyes, was a killer. I had killed an ant. And he was weeping because the ant he had stepped on, but I also think because for nine years old, this is a terrifying time. So what was it you asked? I can't remember. I hope you do. I hope we're, you do. We're, we're, um, we're trying to figure out how how the, the new space would be governed in terms yes, of... Yes, governed, yes. Thank you. So that if, was, that's my contribution yeah. to this idea, or this if, uh, the need to understand how we're going to govern it. Yeah, or, or if it has a modular modular self-governing system like a like playing chess with a computer so that if we if there's enough checks and balances built into the program then we don't need to have a human democratic call unless there's some kind of an emergency but it figures out the the equivalent of the navajo democratic process within itself so that there's no interference or bias um, or abused. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't know how this will work in reality. And I think that it's a good time to be talking about this because in our 20 discussions, we now have enough content. I believe that we can actually start putting the jigsaw puzzle together. All the pieces are falling into place um, in my mind rather beautifully. So I think our upcoming guest on Thursday is, uh, Shah Jahan Chaudhary, who's going to, who runs NIC, as I've told you before. 
he's a you, you enjoy listening to him because he's a philosopher he's a visionary he has ideas about governance and how cities and how financial uh -huh. things should work and understands the digital age uh, extremely well he's been in this business <coughs> for many years he's not very old but in terms of he's been in business for many years but he's younger than me and he's he has a very clear thought process so i think some of these questions where uh you and i struggle because we're just not aware of the space as much of the internet and the digital issues he will be able to fill in those blanks for us so that when we come back to looking at this again with you me with the other <clears throat> we will know what the best way forward could be to compile curate uh, create the right kind of governance give enough leeway for us to run to ensure that this curiosity um stimulated i won't use the word trigger also um that the imagination is is brought back alive and that people start paying attention reading i find that nobody is using their eyes very very simple things they will not see they will not read between am and pm um speaking to marvi to me to I mean, there's some really fundamental seeing that also will need to be retrained so there's this thing there's this scene there's this scene and then there's this scene so we have multiple different types of scene that will also have to be like that french pastry layered oh you have to look through it you know there's um time for dessert <laughs> yes time for dessert just let me quickly uh remind us that curate curing all of these things have an a rooted like culture agriculture and for me the roots go back down to the biosphere to the earth and these primary elements that we now understand perhaps created all the shapes of matter after the big bang or after shiva woke up after saying om ah. and then everything open that the um things that we do were once understood as giving shape to the forces these powerful forces and we forgotten how to do that so to bring that into this yeah we have to team because there's only a minute left so i don't want but off rudely but yeah. i think a great segue for us to pick up on for next time we'll speak to shaja on thursday and then i will see you on monday thank you everyone for joining us this has been again a heavily packed one hour um have a great rest of the day wherever everyone is stay safe uh, jean look after yourself we'll speak soon thank you everyone khuda hafiz bye next bye. time bye bye, bye.